Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education at the Davis Finney Foundation. And today I am here with some fabulous guests to talk about Next Stride. Uh, Sydney and Carol and Maria are going to talk to us today about um, what it is. We're going to talk about gait and balance and falling and exercises and all the uh, fun stuff that is going to help you improve your quality of life. So Sydney, let me start with you. Can you just tell us a little bit about you and then how you got into this work? Sure. Um, so my name is Sydney Collin. I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Dero Devices. We make the next ride. Um, so a little bit about my background. P personally, I was always kind of obsessed with understanding how the brain works, how the body works. So I studied biomedical engineering at Cal Poly and all of my research background was in kind of the brain, brain computer interfacing, doing deep brain stimulation, um, doing EEG neurofeedback for children with ADHD. And, you know, then I think we'll kind of get into the story, but met somebody with Parkinson's, made this device for them, started the company um, and have been running this company for about four years now. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. Hello, I am a physical therapist in the Central Coast of California, and I met Sydney when she was a student at Cal Poly. And as a physical therapist who works with people with Parkinson's, I became their technical advisor to help help them uh, understand from a therapy standpoint what people with Parkinson's need from the next stride. And I do a lot with the local community here in um, the San Luis Obispo to Santa Barbara area. So I stay pretty busy helping our Parkinson's community. I currently work in a home health setting. So I see uh, people with more advanced Parkinson's more often than the, than the newly diagnosed. Okay, great, thank you so much. Carol. Um, I'm Carol Chang, I'm an occupational therapist. I um, own uh, an aging in place consulting business. And my interest started in Parkinson's because my father-in-law was diagnosed about three or four years ago. And a really good friend of mine is a Parkinson's, owns a whole bunch of Parkinson's clinics nearby. And so I went there to see what they were doing because, you know, I had never heard of doing exercises medicine by that point. You know, I worked in home health as well. You know, we really had limited carryover in terms of OT stuff. Um, and when I saw what she was doing, I was absolutely fascinated. And it just turned out that um, they were having a course a few months later for Parkinson's wellness recovery. And Maria was um, happened to take that class because <laughs> my friend was not available that particular weekend. So that's how I met Maria. Um, and, uh, you know, I heard about, I, I met Sydney because of trying her devices with some of my other patients. And um, I really just found it so fascinating. We did a lot of um, fun videos to show the differences and got to problem solve out with Melanie um, with, you know, with all of these patients. So that, that was the interest part in there. And I do a lot with the Parkinson's community here as well in Jacksonville, Florida, because um, I'm an urban poles instructor as well as a Parkinson's wellness recovery um, instructor. And uh, we recently got a grant where I will be teaching classes on uh, Parkinson's specific home modifications, as well as the exercises specific to Parkinson's that can help. Oh, that's great. I can't wait to hear more about that. So uh, let's get into it. Uh, Sydney, what is the origin story of Next Drive? Yeah, so I hinted about this at this a little bit in my intro, but um, when I was studying biomedical engineering at Cal Poly, I met this local veteran named Jack Brill who lived with Parkinson's disease and he suffered from this mobility symptom called freezing of gait, which is you know, one of the most common, one of the most debilitating symptoms of Parkinson's. It stops people from being able to walk. So it's medically defined as a sudden onset of immobility, but Jack will explain it as feeling like his feet are glued to the floor or stuck in a box of cement, right? So no matter how hard he tries, he can't pick up even one foot. So, so he came to me and he said, look, I know that there are these visual and auditory cues that work because I use them in my physical therapy clinic every time I go and I can walk great. And then I come home and I'm stuck in a wheelchair all the time. I can't go to the bathroom by himself, by myself. I can't go to the, go on a walk with my wife, Sandy. You know, I can't live my life. Um, and he actually used to be an engineering professor. So he was like, I know there's a way to make this portable. Um, and so I partnered with him and made this device for him. 
And the first prototype was this kind of big clunky like, box that we had made with these like big arcade button push buttons for him to be able to activate the laser in the metronome. Um, and it was pretty incredible to be able to see Jack being able to walk, you know, for the first time in years by himself, being able to walk around his house. He was so excited about it and, you know, felt really good to be able to help him in that way. And I should say outside of, you know, just this one device for Jack, you know, I had been looking into the research and found that there are over a hundred peer reviewed articles that have been published showing the efficacy of visual and auditory cues for people with Parkinson's, right? There's so much data out there showing that these cues work. And I remember thinking, it is just ridiculous to me that we know this is effective. It's standard of practice at any physical therapy clinic, yet people don't have access to this at home on whatever cane walker walking pole they're already using. Um, so started a company, got the device out to market. Well, that's unbelievable. And we need more people like you to, to be out here doing this. So um, I met Sydney, uh, I was thinking it was like three years ago or so. We, we did an event um, on technology and you were there and just so excited about the device and, and what was happening. But I, and I, I'm gonna share um, with the community sort of pre, now right like what was going on mm -hmm. but can you bring us up to date anything like what's been happening with the next stride and what's gone on for the last three years let's let's get everybody up to date oh yeah good question okay let's see so we are now selling in seven countries including the u.s which is fantastic it's you know paid for by the government in new zealand and australia and denmark um, and i think norway the government pays for it as well too Within the US, we've partnered with an organization called the Parkinson's Wellness Fund, where they will cover the cost for anybody who needs financial assistance. We are kind of still going through the insurance process in the US. It's a much slower process here than it is um, in the EU. Um, we are an approved vendor for the VA, so any veteran can get this device for free right now. And then we are in development um, for a belt attached unit, so people who don't use canes and walkers can have access to the visual on short cues as well. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, Maria, I would love to hear a little bit from you since you um, served as a technical advisor while Sydney was developing this. What were the things that you noticed and what, what was some of the um, expertise that you brought to this project? Okay. So as Sydney said, there's a lot of good research and we use visual auditory cueing in therapy all the time. I teach it as a faculty member for Parkinson's Wellness Recovery and having that device easily accessible for people to use. A lot of what I helped with was trying to make the device work on different devices. So not everybody needs a certain walker, not everybody uses a walker. People benefit well from, we can talk about the um, poles and how urban poles or hiking poles really help people with Parkinson's get moving. Some people use a cane, and some people with freezing, we can talk, we'll talk probably more about that, really benefit or do not benefit or have trouble using the device because that adds a cognitive load. It's another task that they have to manage is to manage a device. So some people need help with their freezing, with their steps, they need those cues, but they don't need a device. So trying to make that device really accessible, really portable and easy for the user to use so they can use it on demand when they you know, need it, they don't have to have it on all the time. There's a lot of different ways to use this device because of its portability, because of the accessibility for the person with Parkinson's to control it. it you know, there's a lot of stigma as Sydney um, talked about with, par with Parkinson's disease itself and especially with freezing. So having a device that's really unobtrusive, that's there if they need it, even just knowing that they have it, I think can reduce some of that freezing because it reduces that anxiety, which is one of those triggers for the freezing problem. So there, you know, I've worked with them a lot on just trying to make that device really accessible, really um, portable, I think is the big thing. There have been some other devices that are attached to their queuing devices attached to bigger, heavier walkers and things, but that's not the right assistive device for everybody. So that's been kind of my role. And then just trying to help from a therapy perspective. 
how, you know, getting it out there into the therapy clinics. I strongly believe that everybody with Parkinson's should see a therapist. PTs and OTs um, have a lot to offer the community. So it's really important that, you know, we see you as a person with Parkinson's early on and help, you know, guide you through this, you know, long chronic disease process. So that's been my, my role with, with uh, Nextride. Yeah, and if I can add, I, yeah, if I can add, I think that I just want to underscore, I think it made a big difference really understanding, you know, what size of buttons make sense, you know, how do people attach this, we want it to make sure that it's really easily accessible for people, as Maria was saying, and I think that made a really big difference because a lot of people who are working and developing products aren't necessarily thinking about the size of the button, you know, the clickiness of the button, if it gets held down for too long, you know, does it click twice or does it only click once? There was a lot of kind of thought that had to go into that, especially for people with Parkinson's who might have tremors, who might have some other things going on that we need to think about. Yeah. Um, well, how many um, prototypes did you did you go through before you kind of landed on the magic the magic of it a lot over yeah. a long time um I can't even I don't think I could tell you how many because there was a few like complete redesigns and then and then on top of that then there was okay well let's change this button a little bit let's change the size of this knob let's you know we need to make this band more secure we need the band to be stretchier you know there's a, a you know an infinite amount of small changes that made i would say we completely redid the device probably three or four times mm -hmm. well, i remember the big clunky and original device that you brought yeah. to the support group there and at the ihop in san luis yeah. um, <laughs> And then getting it, you know, small and how to fit what needed to be in the device into something that was really compact and portable was the big challenge. How to yeah. attach, that was another big challenge, you know, to make it easily attachable to different size um, poles for frames of walk or for canes for hiking poles so that it is, you know, accessible across different devices because people sometimes use different devices. If you're going out hiking, you're gonna use your hiking poles. You maybe if you're in a you know, more formal environment, maybe you use your cane if you're, you know, and as you know, things change, you may need to use a walker later on. So you're not buying something attached to any one device. You have that flexibility, you know, across settings and across um, the disease severity. So that's, there is a lot of change, but yeah. It's and so you, it's currently right now, it's one device that everybody gets and they can mm -hmm. move it around. How much does that one device weigh? Um, less than a pound. Okay. Amazing. That's yeah. great. I just know everybody's having that question right now as they're listening. To yeah. This. Um, yeah. It's I, pretty I'm going to show, show it. I'll, I'll share some um, screens and videos of it for sure. Okay. Uh, Carol. So how did, how does this work for you? I know that you work with aging in place and you're dealing with, or we're dealing with a lot of people in their homes. How has uh, this device helped in your work and working with uh, pe people as an occupational therapist? So it's actually um, great that Sydney told that story, the origin story, because it's exactly, I'm kind of doing this in practice now. So, you know, people are used to seeing, you know, all the, the brightly colored tape on the floor at a, at a gym, at a PT clinic. But you, when people, when you're talking about a home, this is the place that you feel comfortable in. Like you don't want to have these, you don't want your house to start to feel like a rehab center and have to put down these things just to function. So before Signe's um, device, I was putting down painter's tape, blue painter's tape, because that's a very good high color contrast um, way that can be a little bit more um, flexible, like as we're figuring out what the step length is and what the ideal space is, um, and it's inexpensive. <laughs> so, um, so we would we we started with like a little track like in front of the living room, and then because it works so great. We went, you know, living room to kitchen, and of course, the most important bedroom to bathroom. And so, eventually, we just ended up with this like railroad track all the way through the house in this beautiful historic home with gorgeous wood floors. You know, it really it functions, but is that long term? You know, it's really not great for that kind of thing. So, 
So Sydney's device makes that so it's a lot more portable that you can, you know, use it throughout the house and still be your house. And another um, big reason why I love it is in that bathroom setting, because in the bathroom with all the tiles, that tape doesn't stay well. And I had another client where they were having a lot of incontinence issues so that that floor had to be mopped every day. So that that's just not reasonable to have to the maintenance in there. It's just not reasonable to have to like put it down, put it back, put it on, put it back. And then my last um, thing that I loved about it is that when do Parkinson's patients need to go to the bathroom at night when it's dark and, you know, having a laser, bright laser, it's a perfect scenario in the dark because you're not looking at painter's tape. You don't get the color contrast that you do in the daytime. So you kind of, it's, it's both things. And you know, I remember talking to Sydney also about, you know, using this product outside and we had no problem getting uh, the patient from the house to the beach. So using it on the sidewalk was great. You know, you get the color contrast of the green to the, you know, beige color. So that's usually a really common question that I, that I get. So yes, we use it a lot in the house and it's, it works great to solve a lot of those um, resistant points that people might have against you know, why do you have tape in your house and all those <laughs> stigma questions. Um, but it also functions great outside too, where you, it's not realistic for your spouse to run ahead of you and lay down like track in front of you. <laughs> right. So. right. Okay, cool. So let's say um, somebody buys it. I, I want to, I want to get into the nitty gritty of, okay, how is it truly going to help me with balance, not falling? Like how difficult is the setup? Do I, would I set it up by myself? Are there tutorials? Does somebody serve as like a, you know, customer success service person and they walk me through it? What's going on? Yeah. So, um, we, when you get the device, it comes with a little instruction manual and you can just follow that and get it set up on your own. We did a survey of about 40 people and 96% of people said the person with Parkinson's was able to set it up themselves with no help from a caregiver. That's so amazing. the feedback that we've gotten is it's really easy to set up, really easy to use. Um, that being said, if you do need help there, we have YouTube videos of how to attach on two canes and walking poles and walkers and rollators and different types of rollators. Um, so you should be able to get all the videos you need on our YouTube channel if you have any questions about how to set it up. And then in addition to that, if you call our um, support line, which is just the the phone number on our website. It actually goes to my cell phone right now. <laughs> um, so I'll pick up and I can help anybody kind of set up their device that way. I've FaceTimed people before, gotten on Zoom calls with people to make sure that they know where to put it and know how it goes. Um, but you know, I get those calls maybe once a month. So uh -huh. people are generally able to set it up themselves pretty easily. Okay. And is some of the, you know, like customization, is it stride length? Is it you're you're kind of going and then the 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 device is calibrating and then saying okay this is your sort of normal stride length or what Maria you have your <laughs> uh, I, I do think it's best to you know yeah. work with a therapist whether it's an OT or a PT to really help you figure out which cues whether it is the laser light or the metronome and which situations work so there's auditory cueing and visual cueing and there's different ways to use those cues you can set that line, that laser line, so that you're stepping on it, you're stepping over it. You can set it out farther ahead so that you're reaching towards it, so that you're not looking down, which could contribute to some of your gait problems. So there's lots of flexibility within the next stride itself and how you use it. So typically you'll set that laser line out in front of you so that you can step to it or step over it. I think that's what most people do, but there are other ways to use that laser line in in lots of different you know depending on the situation and depending on how you respond to the cues because mm -hmm. everybody with parkinson's is different and depends on what your triggers are what's triggering your gait problems or your freezing problems right is it anxiety is it the doorway is it turns and which cue is better for you so you know there are times we've talked a lot about whether we should develop a little ear you know like a way for that metronome to be uh, an earbud mm -hmm. so that it's easily heard in a crowded situation. A lot of times people, you know, Carol can talk a lot about those situations in the home. There's a lot of things that trigger freezing in the home, but a crowded situation, 
um, it, where you're out in public is oftentimes when people have trouble and that's what makes that so debilitating because people stop going out, they stop going places. So, you know, there's, there's still lots of development to come as to how do we make this even better for people with Parkinson's. And that's the beauty of having a, a, a brilliant engineer, you know, develop this device that's passionate about it because we can look at what else might help. But, you know, people usually figure out what works best for them and there's enough variability that they can change it up depending. But I, I truly believe a therapist who understands Parkinson's which is a key that they can understand how to help you use the device even more efficiently and more effectively for your specific problems. Yeah, so that brings up so many questions for me. First one being, uh, just because I really do not know, is are there other conditions that you see in your clinic that they have freezing of gait? They're, they're not Parkinson's, but this is like a condition that other diseases have? Is this, or is freezing of gait really just a Parkinson's thing? Do you want to talk, Sid? So I have, I can talk about research, right? Because that's, I'm a huge research nerd and I spend a lot of time looking at research. Um, that being said, I'll let Carol and Maria talk about their experience actually in the clinic working with people. Um, so from the research, you know, what we've been able to see is that not necessarily the term freezing of gait seems to be specific to Parkinson's. Um, however, there's research that has been published showing the efficacy of these exact visual and auditory cues being effective in stroke rehab, in multiple sclerosis, in cerebral palsy, in traumatic brain injury. And we've even started to do some research ourselves in um, orthopedic surgery rehab. It's really fascinating as we get this device out and we start to work with more and more physical therapists and clinicians, you know, the more like we start to learn so much more about who else we can help with this product um, because it's really you know a tool that people can use to create gait symmetry to increase their stride length to increase their uh, kind of base of support we actually just published a case study with Bellevue Hospital in New York on their inpatient stroke rehab facility uh, for ataxia and they, you know, moved the device around. They made the device, the laser line parallel to the to the direction of movement rather than perpendicular. And they had people step on either sides of the line to broaden their base of support. So I know physical, I am just in awe of physical therapists right. and occupational therapists and people that are, you know, actively using devices and products to help people because they come up with all of these amazing ways to help people. Right. Okay, so um, the reason why I asked that question is because I think a lot of people will say, well, I go to a physical therapist, they don't know anything about Parkinson's. And so um, I, I think this is very good for people that, that get the device and they can share it with their physical therapist and they can say, hey, I got this device, here are the videos, here's, like, here's how it works. Yeah. Um, you can learn how to do it and maybe they'll you know, start to share it with other people. So I think that's great. It's not so distinct to people with Parkinson's, yeah. like um, you got to find a Parkinson's specialist physical therapist in order to, to do this. So that is really great. Um, yeah. Can I add I, one thing, Mel? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. I think something else, as we're talking about kind of who is a good fit for the product, something else that's worth noting is even though this device was built to help people overcome freezing of gait and, you know, these visual and auditory cues have been shown to reduce the duration of freezing of gait episodes and the frequency of episodes and reduce falls by 40%, huge numbers there. Um, there's a recent study that came out, I think it was out of, I want to say Stanford, but it was somewhere in California, it could have been USC, um, doing using visual and auditory cues to help with um, balance. So even before you start freezing, you can still use cues to help, you know, increase your stride length, to reduce shuffling, to make sure that, you know, you are creating, you know, um, symmetrical gait patterns and normal gait patterns to prevent mm -hmm. that freezing from coming on in the first place. Yeah, that's great. So Carol from a so from a Parkinson's perspective, you know, you, or a brain perspective, when you think about what's going on in that Parkinson's brain, you know, there's not enough dopamine to innervate some of those basal ganglia pathways. But as we age, you know, everybody's losing dopamine in your brain 
every decade, but it's just that it's, you know, accelerated much, much faster in people with Parkinson's. So people lose a lot of those automatic everyday function first. So this, you know, those nice big steps, all of that stuff is, you know, kind of what happens first. So everybody can benefit from a little boost to um, making their movements a little more intentional, not having to rely as much on that automaticity that we start losing as we get older. The other part that I think contributes a lot to problems with gait, balance, freezing is posture. So we think about that um, flex posture that happens as we get older and is even more severe in Parkinson's. So that also can, lead to some of those issues with balance. When you don't have good posture, you don't have good balance when you're in that posture. So having you know, those cues to help you look up, maybe look out, look past that light, or follow those cues um, and the, the metronome help make everyone's gait and balance better. So it's really interesting to see how it works in a lot of other populations with neurological issues. And a lot of that is, you know, cueing that brain to become more intentional and to, to work, you know, use different pathways. There are um, atypical Parkinson's that have freezing as well. So it's not just Parkinson's, some of the atypical Parkinson's do, but I do see that flex posture shuffling gait happening a lot in the general older population that isn't necessarily Parkinson's. Right. Yeah, that's great. Carol, can you talk a so, little bit about the, uh, in the, in the home, like what are some of the things that trigger, we were talking about this, what are some of the things that make, um, freezing of gait worse in the home? Um, I, I will totally answer that. I just wanted to like tag in with like after what Maria just said, because, you know, I really believe that this, this is not necessarily a device just for Parkinson's. You you put this in the hands of a clinician who's like problem solving out things, and they're suddenly looking at this in lots of different ways. So that exact thing that she was just talking about with you know the parallel lines, or maybe you were talking about it, you know the lines. Um, I've done that in in the home as well, where I'm trying to increase base of support because you know they are you know walking down the hallway and down a narrow hallway maybe where you know they've got their feet right next to each other. So I love having you know visual cues. Step on the line. Step on the line. Step on the line. And then you know a big part of managing freezing is weight shifting. So when you're making people shift from one side, one like laser light to the other laser light, you're, you're teaching, it's training, you're teaching them, like, how am I going to get out of that freezing, I need to take the step, I need to wait shift to the left, I need to wait shift to the right, you know, so it's a training tool for that, it can be, it, it can be so much more than just with patients with Parkinson's, it can be for everybody, and my experience with Urban Poles is the same, where this is a product developed by Parkinson for Parkinson's that I use for all uh, diagnosis now. So I see that with um, Nextride as well, that this may have started with the Parkinson's population, but can be easily you know, yeah. used to a person's imagination, a clinician's imagination and going, well, why don't we try attaching this to the top of the, um, the top of the door frame so that they'll step over that line, <laughs> you know, and I've actually thought about that in the home. So you're back to your question about what kind of issues trigger that freezing in the home door frames are huge. So getting through like the narrow space, um, and, you know, the anxiety of knowing that I often, you know, every time I try to get through there, I just, you know, I, I know that it's about to get smaller. So I start taking smaller steps. Um, and, you know, if you could put like the laser right in front of it um, so that you had a line right there, you would say, okay, your brain would say, okay, I need to step over it. Now, I also, I also try to use all the senses just because, you know, with Parkinson's, you're losing all of those automatic reactions. So, so, you know, the important thing is to try to, you know, use your other senses. So the metronome, your auditory sense, okay, I've got to keep that rhythmical gait back forth, back forth, right? And then the visual, so I'm seeing the line, but also tactile. So I always put up a grab bar on the outside of the door and on the inside of the door so that my brain says, okay, I'm going to hold this. What's my next step? I got another hand. Okay, where does my other hand go? So that promotes weight shifting, forward weight shifting, that can, you know, keep that motion going instead of wanting to kind of stay in that one spot. So you're using, you're resisting against something in order to get those feet up. 
Um, I, I mean, I think doorways to me is like the primary thing, but also, as I mentioned, the, the narrow hallways are terrible for that. So generally, you know, if, if I have extra space in there, I probably try to do like two, um, like grab bars all the way down, or I'll do like handrails that are put into the studs, you know? So for the exact same reason we were just talking about, it's weight shifting left, right, left, right, <laughs> all the way down the, all right. the way down that space so that you can be taking those nice big steps. Yeah, which is another you know, reason why it's so important to declutter when you, when you have it. So you just don't want so many things in your eye, you know, in your visual that you're going to get caught, right? Like we always, out, people will always say, I'm sitting in my chair and I know I've got to go to the bathroom. I know I've got to take a right turn at the table, left turn there. Like they plan it all out. Right. And so uh, the more sort of open space you can leave yourself, the better. Turning. Um, I think turning yeah. is the other issue, right? And that's, I think more of the fall risk is definitely with turning. So again, having those cues in those spaces, making, you know, modifying your home. And I know that that's, you know, opening up spaces, reducing clutter, making things more efficient is one way to do that. But having those auditory cues or visual cues to help you in those tight, tighter spaces, because you can't, you know, bathrooms are never, there's always, always issues and turning to get to the toilet or getting, you know, getting over that, you know, threshold in the shower, all of those right. things are issues with the, or places that could trigger freezing. Right. So we talked about some of the real tactical actions to take in the home. Um, what would you say are some exercises that you might, when somebody gets this device, what are some complementary exercises that you're always going to make sure they're continuing to do so that the it's actually working as best as it possibly can? Maria, you might Okay. <laughs> so you, people with Parkinson's need um, skilled exercise, exercise that works on some of those problem areas. There, there's research that shows everybody with Parkinson's, everybody needs cardio, you know, like aerobic exercise. You need to get, you know, that brain exercise so it can work optimally. And that helps with your thinking and your cognition. It helps with everything. But specifically, the things that the symptoms of Parkinson's that really affect your movement have to do with your posture, that tendency to flex posture. So you need exercise that's really going to help you stand tall. You have better balance when you're tall. You can pick up your feet. And as Carol said, you have to weight shift. You have to be able to use, you know, to have fluid movements. You have to have some mobility in your spine. And that's another issue where people with Parkinson's get really stiff and rigid and can't move efficiently or fluidly. So things that incorporate lots of whole body rotation and mobility are really good. And, the, and this those transitions. So taking that next step, how do you do it? And that incorporates all of those kind of principles. So exercise, it incorporates lots of work on being upright and tall and you, strengthening your extensors. People with Parkinson's usually aren't really weak. They need, they also then need to learn, you know, how to move in back in more normal patterns and whatever you know, devices or tools or things that help them do that are good. So lots of vigorous exercise, lots of things that work on, you know, moving with your whole body. I think why we enjoy, one of the reasons we all enjoy working with the Parkinson's population is that people with Parkinson's can do so much that their brain is telling them they can't do. They just mm -hmm. need to know that they can do it. They need to be you know, taught how to access those parts of their brain that can help them move better and using these, these kinds of auditory and visual cues and lots of, we do that in therapy all the time to show people how they can move and that they really can yeah. do so much more than their brain is telling them. So, you know, that's a lot of what, you know, I look at and you have to enjoy what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sydney was talking about dance. I know, you know, urban polling and walking and hiking and all of the, there's so many different ways to exercise. Cycling's great. You know, there's so many things that are good for people with Parkinson's, but it needs to be whole body. It needs yeah. to be, you know, incorporating those things that people with Parkinson's needs and it needs to be fun. You know, there's gotta be some enjoyment in that so that you keep, keep, keep at it. Yeah. So that's what I wonder... my take on. Yeah. One of the things we, you know, we say a lot is also strength training and people say, why do I need to strength train? I'm not trying to do anything. I'm like, no, strength training will help you with falling balance. Like mm -hmm. you're going to catch yourself better. You're, you're just in a more stable situation. Mm -hmm. And, and so. that, that Brady symptom of Parkinson's is 
is that inability to put the right amount of effort into your acti- you know, your functional movements and strength training really helps that. So, you know, that's all, all important. So staying strong, um, for the entire elderly population, we, I think as therapists, we've realized we weren't pushing our, I've been a therapist almost 40 years. So our philosophy of how we help the older population. And as I get older, I realize I've got to train more intensely. I've got to do high intensity interval training. I've got to, you know, keep, you know, it's not, it's not easy exercise, little, little easy exercises aren't enough anymore. We got to really keep at it and we're living longer and we want to live good, you know, quality of, have a great quality of life. We've got to work at it. Yeah. Yeah. So aside from Jim, he was, Jim was the person that prompted you to do this. That right. That's right, Sydney. Jim or Bill? Um, no, why am I um, blanking? Uh, Jack, no, sorry. Jack. I was like, I, Jack. I was like, Jack, Jack Bill. Like, why? Yeah. Okay. When um, you say so, Jim, I'm like, wait, I know people named Jim. I'm like, that's not right. <laughs> Jack, 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 I would love to hear any stories that you guys have from people that, you know, you introduced this to, or they came to you and said, you know, I got this, like that, that changed their, their life. Do you have some to share? I have, I have so many um, <laughs> that it's so hard to choose. I think one of my favorites is um, Walter, um, this guy, Walter, who lives in New York. He's done, you know, he's fine with me sharing his name because he's done a lot of PR for us already. He's a huge advocate for us and everything that we do with the next ride. Um, and I got a call from him after he got his device. He was like, this thing is amazing. You know, I can go on to go see hockey with my family I can go on hikes with my family like I get to do all of these things and engage in the world in a way that I wasn't able to before because I didn't feel confident that I you know would be able to walk around on my own and it wouldn't just be a burden on people and I think those stories are my favorite because it's not just about like you know I couldn't walk and now I can walk it's about like the things that you can do engaging with family, engaging with your um, social Mm -hmm. group, engaging in life in a way that you weren't able to before. You know, I think- I I think it brings up like that, aside from the belt, um, I'm excited to hear about that, but it it brings up the idea of not only do you get to do things and be out with your family, but because you have your cane or your walker, your poles or whatever, like the world is giving you more space. So you don't have- as much anxiety, right? When yeah. you're, out, you're thinking I might, oh gosh, I'm going to jump into somebody or they're going to run it, you know, run into me that you just get, you give it more space. You can relax a little bit and trust that the device is going to keep you moving. Yeah. I think that and, confidence is huge. Mm-hmm. You know, it's we, just knowing that if you have, if, you, if freezing does happen, you have a way to overcome it. Mm-hmm. And so it gives you more confidence to do the things you want to do. Mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Well, Maria. In the development, we talked a lot about that, that, mm-hmm. you know, not, you don't have to have the device turned on all the time to have it get, give you a benefit. So just yeah. knowing that you have that device and you can turn it on or off as you need it gives people that confidence to get out and go and do things. It's that fear of having a freezing attack, you know, not, so there's freeze, you know, you're trying to prevent freezing from happening, but you also have to have a way to get out of a freeze. So how do you recover from a freeze? And so you can use that in both, you know, having the device be portable and kind of at your fingertips and under your own control as a person with Parkinson's gives you that confidence that, you know, you can either turn it on when you know the situation, maybe you need it, or if you get into a freeze, you know, you can, you know, use that device to get started again. Um, so that confidence is a huge thing and the portability and, and it's not something somebody else has to control for you. You can control that. You may not even need to turn it on. You just know that it's there and then you're able to go. Right. So that's, that's a lot of fun. And my favorite, one of my favorite stories, we did a, a little video when you were first launching the device with Earl and I just yeah. loved, he had this be- beautific smile when I, we were trying to, you know, he was freezing. We were just demonstrating this and we turned the device on and he took a big step and he just had this, you know, beautific smile. He was just so thrilled to, to be able to do that on his own, right? Yeah. Just to go. So I uh, love that. So nice. 
Yeah. And I, Carol's story is one of my favorites as well. She kind of talked about it already, but the, do you want to talk about the person that you helped with the next ride? Yeah. So that patient really next ride just changed his life because that was the same one that had railroad tracks through his house and just really stark, significant difference um, between, you know, getting the information to step on it and then not, you know, you can see as soon as like, he doesn't have the visual cues, he's back to freezing, just like two, two steps later. I mean, it's really automatic. And what I, my favorite story with that particular one was that he only lived two blocks from the beach, but he hadn't seen the beach in a year and a half. And so it was because of Sydney's device that he could actually see the ocean again. So I think that that is a, that's one of those life changers, quality of life things that makes a difference, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. That's great. So um, I want to review really quickly where, pe how people can get it for free. So veterans, um, mm -hmm. people who apply through the, what is it? Parkinson's well, wellness, Parkinson's Fund. wellness fund, yep. wellness fund. Okay. Um, any, anything else where they can get it for free? Um, those are the two options to get it paid for. Okay. Um, the other option is payment plans, which yeah, we have okay. available on our website. And how, how much is a device if somebody in the U.S. right now just wanted to go buy it? $4.99. So almost $500. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, and are you working on making it like a durable medical equipment? Is that part of what you're working on? Okay. Great. Yeah. So we're going through the process with CMS um, to kind of create a new HICPIX code. This is, I'm going way too into detail that we need to. Okay. Yes, we're working on it and yeah. it will be under durable medical equipment, an accessory to a cane walker walking pole. Great. Great. Um, and then, oh yeah, you said New Zealand, Australia, Denmark, those, those people can get it through there. Norway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Through the Great. government will pay for it hundred percent. Yeah. And the VA will pay for it. So that, and there are a lot of veterans with, with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's a, a very big deal that the VA for will sure. pay for. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Well, and a lot of veterans ask, you, you have to pay for it out of pocket. I mean, to change your life. Huh? I, I think I, that's good, you know, and like share it with your family and friends and have people pitch in if, it, if it's a challenge. Right. Um, yeah. And really more importantly, you know, Sydney, like, can, you can return it. You can try it, return mm -hmm. it, see if it's for you. Oh, that's so right. that's really I think, important part to understand. I mean, you're not just committing 499 and, you know, you're stuck and, and that's it. I mean, you know, her, she wants people to try it. So she wants you to at least order it, try it, send it back if it's yeah. not the right fit. So yeah. give it's it an opportunity. It's a pound. It's a pound. Doesn't, yeah. It's not like you're shipping back 400 pounds of something, yeah. some, some sort of thing, right? That's it's a big, huge, big, huge walker. Yeah. Right? It's easy. easy. Yeah. Very easy. Carol's a better yeah. salesperson than I am, <laughs> but, she's a, but she's right that we do have a 30-day money-back guarantee. So we want people to try it. We'll pay for shipping both ways. There's really no risk. You know, yeah. try it, use it for a month. If it works, great. If it doesn't work for you, we're not asking you to pay $500 just to pay $500, you know, send it back to us. We'll refund you. We'll pay for shipping. That's you know, great. we That's want great. it to be available to help people. We're not trying to right. sell it to anybody who's not, who's not going to be helpful for it. Well, that's and, and she also makes it hassle free because I don't know about you guys, but every time I order things, I think, crap, I'm going to have to go to the UPS store and I got to tape it back, box it up. I mean, you know, this is like the label comes with you. It's like, you know, close it all up, slap on the label, like throw it out, out the door. OK, so it just take out all those barriers, make it easy. You know, that's what she's figured out to do. So definitely worth a try. Yeah, well, that's amazing. Yeah. Thanks, Sydney, for making it easy for everybody. Um, is there anything that I didn't ask that I should have that uh, we need to talk about for how amazing this device is? Not that I can think of. I mean, I think yeah. the biggest thing that we just discussed is, you know, we can't, all I can do is recite research back to people. So a lot of people will ask me like, is this going to work for me? And all I can say is, you know, here's the research that I've seen that shows that it's effective for this population. Um, and I think the biggest thing is just try it, you know, see if it works. It's as a lot of physical therapists say, it's another tool in your toolbox. You know, this might not be the life saving thing for you, but it might help you get to the bathroom yeah. by yourself. It might help you just make your life a little bit easier. Right. And I mean, in my opinion, it's worth a try. Yes, it is.
And, well, you know, from, you. I was going to say from my home mods experience, you know, I, people order all kinds of things from Amazon, a lot of things that they, and that ends up cluttering the closet, things that well-meaning family members think maybe this could help. Maybe I could, you know, it could make their life a little bit better. And if you just think about how much money people are putting towards products that they are guessing will help consider like that Sydney's product has research, it's research backed, you know, you have a million and a half testimonies of people who've tried it and you can return it. So for all those reasons, right? Yeah. And, and Mel, the other issue is we were working on development was we wanted something that would last over time, right? So mm -hmm. you can use this device early when you're, you know, you're just out hiking, use it in your hiking poles. And then that can transition, you know, five or, you know, you can use it over the whole, you know, five, 10, if, you know, over that whole time frame. So yeah. when mm -hmm. you think about that cost spread out over a long period of time, it's not a lot of money. Yeah. Right. Um, and she said she has payment plans, right? And there are payment mm -hmm. plans. Yep. We're making it absolutely a no brainer. Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Sydney, so much. Thank you, Carol and Maria for being here today. I'm really grateful. And uh, I feel like I could talk about this topic forever. It was really fun. And I just, uh, this community is so lucky that you met Jack and you figured this out. It's just, it's incredible. So I hope that everybody um, that watches this ends up ordering one and trying it out. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mel. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you.